Welcome back. In the last two videos, we looked at a simple MIPS implementation that used a single long instruction cycle for each instruction. The clock period had to be 800 picoseconds long to accommodate the load word. So every 800 picoseconds, a new instruction comes into the CPU and will finish before the next clock cycle. While an instruction is in the CPU, the instruction has the whole CPU to itself. As the instruction travels through the data path, it utilizes some components and moves on, leaving the components it's finished with idle. What if we could let those idle components work on other instructions? That's the basic idea of pipelining. With pipelining, each individual instruction won't get through any faster. The latency is the same but the overall instruction throughput will be faster. All modern processors use pipelining. In fact, the P in MIPS used to stand for pipelining since MIPS was designed for efficient pipelining. The book uses a laundry analogy to explain pipelining. In the top diagram, we have the non-pipeline laundry approach. A person starts the wash, the dry, the fold, and put away. And only after all that do they start the next load. In the bottom diagram, we have the pipeline approach to laundry. A person starts the first load of wash. As soon as the washer's free, they throw those clothes in the dryer and start another load. Instead of taking eight hours for four loads of laundry, the pipeline version just takes 2.3 hours. In general, the speed up approaches the number of pipeline stages. So if you had infinite loads of laundry, which by the way you will when you have children, the speed up would approach 4. To implement pipelining, we need to divide the MIPS data path into five stages. Instruction fetch, instruction decode and register read, ALU execution, data memory access, and writing back to the register file. Now instead of one long clock cycle, each instruction executes in five short clock cycles. Here's what that looks like. On the top, we have the single cycle implementation, the non-pipeline version. Each instruction has the whole CPU to itself. At the end of the 800 picosecond clock cycle, a new instruction can come into the CPU. In the bottom, we see what pipelining will do for us. As the first instruction coming into the CPU finishes its instruction fetch stage, that circuitry is now free, and so another instruction can come in and start being fetched. Now with our short clock cycle of 200 picoseconds, it will take 5 times 200 picoseconds, 1000 picoseconds, to execute an instruction, but this is worth it because our throughput is improved. Ideally, our speedup will approach 5 since we have 5 stages. Keep in mind that each instruction doesn't execute faster, it's just that we're working on more instructions at a time. As I mentioned earlier, the MIPS instruction set architecture was designed for pipelining. All instructions are 32 bits, which makes it easier to fetch and decode. The few instruction formats makes it faster to decode and read the registers. The load store addressing, in that the ALU cannot have a memory operand, prevents some pipeline stalls, and the fact that MIPS is word-aligned makes access faster. However, as we'll see, there will be problems that prevent us from getting this ideal 5 time speedup in throughput. I'd like you to pause the video here and take a minute to explain what's going on in this diagram. You can explain it to yourself, or you can explain it to your cat or dog. It doesn't matter if they don't understand. Explaining things out loud reinforces your understanding. So go ahead and hit pause now. Okay, so I hope your cat or dog enjoyed that. What's going on, of course, is that each clock cycle, a new instruction comes into the CPU. Once we get five instructions in the CPU, the CPU is working on five instructions at a time. So this is great. What could possibly go wrong? You can pause the video if you like and ask the cat. What your crafty cat probably told you is that there could be dependencies between instructions that prevent an instruction from being executed. We call these dependencies hazards. A hazard is any situation that prevents 
starting the next instruction in the next clock cycle. There are three types of hazards. A structure hazard means that some required resource is busy. Structure hazards don't happen in MIPS. It would happen if we combined the data and instruction memories. But MIPS does have the other type of hazards. The first is a data hazard. We need to wait for the previous instruction to complete its data access or writing back to the register file. And the third type is a control hazard, a branch hazard. When we start executing a branch instruction, we don't know yet if we're branching or not. Let me explain these diagrams from the book. The way it works is that shading on the left means a right. So we see in the right backstage we have shading on the left. And shading on the right means reading. So for reading from instruction memory or reading a register file, we have shading on the right. No shading means that component's not used, so an add doesn't use the data memory. And full shading means it's busy the whole clock cycle. Let's look at data hazards. In these two instructions, we see that the destination register as zero in the add is the same as one of the source registers in the sub. The problem is that S0 won't be written to the register file until this stage here. So if we want to read it, that means we would need for the pipeline to stall twice, two pipeline stalls or bubbles. One thing we can do to avoid having the two pipeline stalls is forwarding or bypassing. So instead of waiting for the register to be written to the register file, we could go ahead and grab it as soon as it comes out of the ALU and forward it to the next instruction. This will require extra connections in the data path. The load use hazard is a special kind of data hazard. Again, we have a destination register in the load word that is one of the source registers in the sub instruction. Instead of waiting for S0 to be written back to the register file, we can go ahead and grab it as soon as it's retrieved from data memory and forward it. Notice that even with forwarding, we're still going to have one pipeline stall. See if you can identify any hazards in this code and think about reordering the instructions to avoid hazards. Again, pause the video, maybe see what your cat thinks. But don't ask the dog, he'll just think you're about to take him for a walk and start jumping around. Here are the hazards, highlighted in red. What we can do is take this load word instruction and move it further up in the code. It won't change the semantics of the code at all, but it will make sure that there's one instruction between each load and use. For this short block of code, the code on the left would take 13 clock cycles, the code on the right only 11. So who's doing this code scheduling? Well, don't bother doing it in Mars because Mars is emulating a non-pipeline CPU, so there are no hazards. We only get hazards once pipelining is introduced. The code scheduling could be done by a compiler or a CPU, and we'll talk much more about that later. Let's look at control hazards. Control hazards happen anytime there's a branch. Look at this first branch at address 40. Let's say we start executing it and then start executing the instructions immediately below on the assumption that we're not branching. And then at some point in the pipeline, we realize, wait, we really were supposed to branch. So those three instructions that had started executing will need to be bubbled out. And then on the next clock cycle, we can start where we're really supposed to be. This would waste a lot of clock cycles. In order to minimize the number of clock cycles wasted, we could add some circuitry in the ID stage to determine earlier if we're branching or not. Adding this extra circuitry would reduce the number of pipeline stalls to one instead of three. Branch instructions often causes stall. In the spec benchmark programs, 17% of instructions were branches. So this would increase CPI by 17% even with only one pipeline stall for branch. The simplest form of branch prediction that can be implemented is to always just predict that we're not going to branch. If that's correct, as seen in the top diagram, then no stall is required. 
And if that's wrong, as shown in the bottom diagram, no harm's done. The instruction that started to execute is bubbled out, essentially turned into a no-op, and then the next clock cycle, we restart with the instruction where we should have branched to. What MIPS does is a delayed branching, implemented by MIPS assemblers. The instruction following the branch is always executed. If the branch should have been taken, it will be taken after that one extra instruction. A MIPS assembler designed for a pipeline system would select an instruction that doesn't have any dependencies, not affected by the branch, to place after the branch. There are two types of branch prediction. Static branch prediction means that an assembler compiler did it, and dynamic branch prediction means that the CPU did it. For static branch prediction, an assembler compiler will make assumptions based on typical branch behavior at loops, predicting backward branches are taken and forward branches are not. For dynamic branch prediction by a CPU, one method is to have extra circuitry measuring behavior for each branch. Essentially, a table of addresses in a binary field whether or not the branch was taken last time. If it's correct, great. If it's wrong, it will stall the pipeline, refetch, and update the history. Surprisingly, this can be up to 90% accurate. This is a first look at how we might divide the single cycle implementation into five stages or sections. Data flows generally left to right, with two exceptions shown in blue, when we update the PC and when we write back to the register file. Each stage will take one shorter clock cycle and we'll be working on only one instruction in that stage. Here we see how the processor can work on different instructions concurrently with pipelining. Notice that each component, for example the ALU, is working on a different instruction in each clock cycle. Our register file can be supporting two different instructions because we can read from and write to the register file in the same clock cycle. We're going to need to carry information forward for an instruction from stage to stage, and that's the purpose of these pipeline registers shown here conceptually in blue. For the five stages, we have four pipeline registers separating the stages. They're named according to the stages that they separate. For example, the first one is if slash id, separates the instruction fetch and the instruction decode stages. Next, we look at how the load word instruction would travel through these stages. The load word is fetch from instruction memory. So we see the right half of instruction memory being shaded and it's written out to the pipeline register. So we see shading on the left for the pipeline register. Meanwhile, we can go ahead and update the PC by four. The PC will also be saved to the pipeline register. We might need it later in case the next instruction is a branch. Any lines you see going through the pipeline registers indicate information that's passed forward. For the instruction decode stage and register read, the instruction is read from the first pipeline register and decoded. RS and RT are read and their values are saved on the next pipeline register. Even though we don't need to read the RT for a load word, the CPU doesn't know that yet. This could be a store word instruction. The 16-bit immediate field is picked off the bottom half of the instruction and it's sign extended to 32 bits and written to the pipeline register. The ALU will read in RS and the sign extended offset, add them together, and place the sum on the next pipeline register, EX slash MEM. In the MEM stage, the address is read from the EX MEM pipeline, the data is read from data memory, and stored out to the MEM WB pipeline register. Finally, in the write back stage, the value loaded from memory is read from the pipeline register goes through the multiplexer, and is written back to the register file. How is a store word different? The instruction fetch and decode stages are the same. In the exe stage, the value to be written in RT has to be carried forward on the pipeline registers. In the mem stage, we're writing to memory instead of reading it. 
and nothing will happen in the write back stage. Which register we're writing to will get overwritten as new instructions come into the pipeline. Therefore, we're going to need to carry that register address, the destination address, forward through all the pipeline registers. This is shown in the extra blue lines added here. These timing diagrams show the clock cycles going left to right and the instructions coming into the CPU top down. Again, we see that we can work on up to five instructions at a time. The register accesses you see for the two load word instructions are not a structure hazard because we're writing to the register in the first half of the first load word and reading from it in the second half of the clock cycle for the second load word. This concurrent execution is a form of parallelism called ILP, Instruction Level Parallelism. Notice that we're getting parallelism on a single processor. Later in the course, we'll talk about other forms of parallelism you can get with multi-core processors. How are the control signals affected by implementing pipelining? The good news is that the control signals are going to be the same. The PC and pipeline registers are written to every clock cycle, so they won't need any control lines. The changes we'll make are to group the control signals by stage, so that the control signals for instruction are carried forward on the pipeline registers as long as needed. The first two stages, IF and ID, don't need any control signals, and you see for the remaining three stages, the signals that they will need. And again, the control signals are exactly the same as we learned in the non-pipeline data path. This is the same table from the non-pipeline version. Now we've rearranged them to group them by how long they need to be carried forward. And we see here in this diagram, the pipeline registered being drawn in an extended way in blue to show these control signals being carried forward. We're working on up to five instructions at a time with a single CPU core. The terms concurrent and parallel apply to hardware or software. When to use each term can be really confusing. I recommend this talk by Rob Pike. He was the developer of the Go programming language. And you can Google it to find it or use this link. The name of his talk is Concurrency is Not Parallelism. It's a very engaging talk and I recommend it. Now I didn't get a free lunch from Chipotle for this free advertising here, but I was standing in line one day thinking about how this reminded me of a pipeline. In each stage, another part of your order is completed, much in the same way that in each stage of a MIPS pipeline, another aspect of the instruction is completed. And you can have stalls at Chipotle as well. Let's say that guy at the end of the line says, hey, wait a minute, I wanted guacamole. Mm -hmm.